What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited... <laughs> God. Hey, resources. <laughs> My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources. And apparently I'm the slightly less thirsty version here than my counterpart all the way from Denver, Colorado. It's Louis Scott Farkas. I just thought the intro needed to be spiced up a little bit, you know? <laughs> God, what, what was that? What are you drinking? I was drinking the last of my black tea. <laughs> Wait, no lemonade? No lemonade, not today. What? Oh, okay. Look, I was at uh, a... <laughs> interestingly themed sandwich place chiba hut that's here in denver and uh they uh had the kind of crappy like lemonade that's just like i, I don't like you know the fake sugar lemonade i don't know mm. it wasn't a fan so i just went with the tea okay yeah no that's that's true i don't like that stuff either yeah so luis is here he's <laughs> <laughs> formerly thirsty and i am too we're gonna we're gonna be on the hunt for quick hits today we're gonna be talking about a lot of little mini topics mini cards stuff like that about uh, midnight hunt and we're gonna go over a few of the archetypes and uh, some broader strokes discussion as well here on this episode of lr before we do let's talk about our sponsor channelfireball.com that's right it's a marketplace now and what that means is if you uh, are in the market for singles you now have an even broader scope of cards to choose from than what cfb had before because now when you go on it actually lists not just cards but also stores you can pick and choose the singles that you want to buy from individual stores and you buy them all at once on CFB and then they arrive at your house. It's really cool. It's a great way, you know, like an aggregator, right? It takes the prices so that you can uh, compare prices to different stores. You know, maybe one of them has one lightly played. One of them has one near mint. Maybe there's a heavily played. You can compare all those right away and get the best price. Um, but you still get to come to one place. And of course, that place is Channel Fireball. And while you're there, you know, they've got all the other awesome stuff that you've grown accustomed to, including the free side of the content, the CFB Pro side of content um, right there. And, you know, you can still pick up the supplies and everything else there on Channel Fireball. There's also is the is the Marketplace Madness still going, Luis? Uh, yeah, Marketplace Madness is still going. So, so there you uh, go. For every ten dollars you spend, you get an entry, and you can win a lot of sweet stuff, including you know Black Lotus, First Edition Charizard, and many more prizes. That's right. So if you uh, get in there, you know you can test out the marketplace, get yourself all situated, kind of figure out how the new system works. It's really straightforward. I, I tested it out myself, and uh, and while you're there, you could even win some cool prizes on Marketplace Madness. Make sure you check out ChannelFireball.com for everything. If you do end up buying something, if you use the affiliate code LR at checkout, it helps out the show and lets them know that we uh, sent you over. So thanks for doing that. The show is also brought to you by FTX, FTX FTX.us. Dot .us for uh United States based customers and for outside of the US is ftx.com this is a place to go for really if if you're interested in crypto cryptocurrencies NFTs digital assets as they're called now becoming more important more and more important part of our world uh as we move forward there's some really cool uses for these technologies and uh every day we find a new one it seems and if you're interested in that ftx.us and ftx.com is a place to go to uh you can invest you can buy sell all that kind of stuff they have an app they also have a website you can also do research you can uh you know check out the trends and all that kind of stuff if that's something you're interested in now i always like to say two things one luis and i not, neither him nor i are um registered financial advisors so make sure that you consult a financial advisor before you do investing of any kind and the other thing is is that make sure you educate yourself right these are volatile markets it's 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 up and down it's all over the place it's pretty crazy times right now and so if you uh, you know, feel comfortable with that, fine, but make sure you know what you're getting yourself into here uh, before you check it out. But when you're ready to, ftx.com uh, and ftx.us will be there for you. Of course, the show's, the show's also brought to you by you via the Patreon, patreon.com slash limited resources. You get a thank you card and a sticker in the mail just for signing up. That's at any level. And you get access to a bunch of cool stuff depending on what level you're at. All levels get access to the Patreon feed, which is where I put up the threads for the Patreon question of the week. This one comes from Phil, who says, Magic aside, what is each of your guys' Mount Everest? Um, some people want to be able to smoke an entire brisket. Some want to actually climb Mount Everest. What do you guys strive to accomplish? And he says, thanks for the great content. It's always a good day when a new episode of LR drops. Thank you, Phil. That's a really nice thing to say. Luis, what, do you, do you have any, um, you know, big, big goal? You know, what, what is your, what, what is the one thing you'd love to accomplish in your life if you could? Well, uh, 
it, 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 magic aside, since I already hit number one mythic on Arena, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> honestly, at this, at this point, uh, you know, in my life, like I've got, uh, you know, I've got a five year old and, and a kid, hopefully coming within this month, if all goes according to plan. Uh, I just like to them to to, to raise uh, as as well adjusted and happy uh, adults as I can. You know, there's mm-hmm. not. It, my perspective has changed since having kids, where you have something outside yourself that you care about a lot, and I. I I, I'm never someone who like derived that much of my identity from being a parent. I, I think you know that, right? Even though mm-hmm. like I wouldn't probably be like talking about it a ton on the show regardless, but it's just part of my life. Like it's a big part of my life. It's an important part of my life, but it's not like the fo- at the forefront of my identity that I, that I have kids. I mean that I, I I think it's important to kind of have these these things all just kind of make up who you are, not not dominate who you are. Mm-hmm. But it is very different having someone in your life who like. You will pay just enormous costs to make their life better, to give them a bit better chance of success. I understand why people go through the great length to like try to get their kids into the right school or what have you. And for me, it's not really about any like mark, traditional markers of success, but more like I just want to you know equip them for all the like kind of terrible things the world's going to throw at you, and uh, hopefully they can get through those things and, and just find some measure of happiness. Because end of the day, I think finding happiness is one of the most important things in life. So. Certainly something that I, I do value for myself as well. Anyways, that's a long, meandering, and philosophical answer. It's not as easy as smoke a brisket, though. On that note, uh, I do have a short-term Everest. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a Mount Fuji, as you will, a little, a little easier to get up to the top. Uh, I think I'm going to actually uh, see if some of my friends here in Denver want to uh, pitch in some money so I can get a uh, Japanese Wagyu uh, brisket and uh, you know, like a frozen one they send over. That, mm. yeah, they run you a couple hundred bucks, like a little, a little more than that, actually. But if I get enough people who are interested, then maybe I can actually smoke like a really, really nice brisket. <laughs> if I moved to Denver, <laughs> could I get in on it? You wouldn't even have to move here. You just have to come out here when it's when it's ready. You, uh, I wouldn't even charge you for this one. <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm interested. Yeah. For me, it, it's interesting. I don't really think in terms of uh, Mount Everest or whatever, like there isn't one one thing. In fact, I, I think it's a strength and a weakness of mine. On one hand, I'm able to live a little more in the moment. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes I, I should aim for something a little bigger. I think, you know, Luis, you're, you're better at that than I am. And, and you've helped me, you know, get some goals and, and kind of be a little more like, Hey, let's, let's be more ambitious. Let's go for this. Let's go for that. Where I'm a little more go with the flow type of person. So I don't really think like that, but I do think in terms of being, kind of a utilitarian, right? Where like I try to do my best to do the things that are the best for the broader group. Um, and I think that dictates a lot of my, like my politics and and stuff like that. So, you know, if, if when I die, I can look back and think that I've added more than I took away. Um, that's something that I'm very keen to, to feel at peace with, uh, in that way. And I've let that decide some things with my career and stuff like that as well. And it's, it's always felt like it was the, the right way to go. So not really a Mount Everest is kind of a marathon <laughs> rather than climbing one mountain, but that's, that's at least the, the end game goal. Um, Luis, let's, uh, do a crack a pack and then we'll talk about the format, uh, in broad strokes and then we'll get into the details. So for our crack a pack, our first card out is actually a foil. It's arcane infusion. That's the, the blue red instant. Look at the top four. You can reveal an instance or sorcery and put it in your hand. And it has a flashback for three blue red. I have been kind of unimpressed with this card. Mm-hmm. You're just happy when you get a spell off it. It's not like it really even gives you that much in the way of selection. Right. So I'm, I don't know. It's okay, but it's not a card that I that I put a high priority on. Yeah, I feel like you have to really care about casting spells, right? Like just putting spells on the stack has to be a big payoff for you. Um, like with Thermo Alchemist or the the one three that I can't remember the name of for some reason. Um, you know, th- those type of actions have to like be paying off because if all you're doing this is just to to get more cards in your hand, it's it's an extremely clunky card draw spell that sometimes misses. Um, non-foil shady traveler. That's the two and a black two, three with menace. And then it flips over into a four, four with menace. Not, uh, not a card I prioritize either. Like the commons no. are just so deep. Yeah. And it, th- especially in this color in black next is famished foragers. That's the three and a red four, three. And when it ETBs, if the opponent lost life, you add three mana to your mana pool and you can pay two and a red to discard a card and then draw a card. 
Oh, you know what? I did, that, that that brings to mind. We didn't discuss the LR versus LL showdown yet. We'll have to touch on that for a sec. Okay, but, we'll do uh, that. Yep. Mm-hmm. You did you did put some good work in on these those famished foragers. So oh, yeah. <laughs> despite despite all that, uh, I'm still not. I, I can I would predict we are not taking any of these cards so far. I'm not yep. even going to make a pick yet. These are and just I, not and I will you. say the for, famished foragers for the most part came out of the sideboard. So there you go. Uh, locked in the cemetery. That's the. The one in a blue that taps down a creature if you have five or more or just keeps it tapped if you don't in your graveyard. Boy, this one's really just fallen off. Um, not only into the not great removal category, but just into the you just don't see these on the battlefield very often category. No, just not not particularly strong. Yeah, the Ecstatic Awakener has risen at least on 17 lands, games, and hand win rate to number one of the Black Commons. And uh, mm-hmm. cards like Locked in the Cemetery tend to go down when that card goes up. Hey, there's the card I couldn't remember the name of, Festival Crasher. <laughs> one in red, one, three, and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, he gets plus two, plus zero. Oh. You know, this is an important common for the blue-red deck. Yeah, and and I've had it do some decent work in black red as well. But mm-hmm. again, we're we're not we're, we're not even to first pick level yet. None of these cards, even in a, out of a bad pack, are you that likely to first pick? That's right. Cl- Clarion Cathars. That's a three and a white three three that makes a one one. Nope. Hobbling Zombie. I guess this oh, is the best go. of what we got. Yeah, two and a black two two DT, and when it dies, it makes a zombie. Yeah, definitely, definitely not not you know not thrilled to first pick it, but it is first pick a bull. So. That's right. Um, Vampire Interloper, one block, two, one flyer, can't block. Um, narrow. Pretty low on this card. Yeah, it's pretty narrow. It, 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 you know, most of the black decks don't want it at all. And really the only one is the black, red Vampire's deck that's like kind of happy to play it. And even then, A, that deck's not that good. And B, it's like, I don't know, there's other cards you'd rather have anyway. So I like Hobbling Zombie for sure here. Your buddy Rotten Reunion, that's the black instant exile <laughs> up to one target creature from a graveyard. You make a 2-2 decay zombie and you can flash it back for one and a black. Where are you at on this? Remember when we streamed together, we played it. Uh, we played a couple of these because we had, was it five Ecstatic We'd, Awakeners in that deck? Oh, yeah. I mean, having five Ecstatic Awakeners obviously was yeah, but an what about outlier. Outside of that I would scenario. say I play this card in about one out of every five of my blue-black decks, about – one out of every four of my black white decks, and I don't play it in red black or black green. Okay. What do you like about it? It's just do you need to make two zombies to sacrifice two other effects? It's okay. basically that. It, okay. If you play best of three, there are some matchups where you you could certainly side this in. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. you play against like a blue green or black green deck that's trying to like self mill, but in best of one, I would not. I would not tend to prioritize this card. Okay. Yeah. And the funny part is, is that the, you know, exiling a thing from a graveyard is like almost secondary here, but uh, it is actually pretty decent too. It, this is a card you've really, uh, I've, I've, I've seen you play a lot more in your stream of lately. It's tapping at the window. That's the one in a green sorcery. Look at the top three cards of your library. You can reveal a creature, uh, from among them and put it into your hand, put the rest in your graveyard, and then it flashes back for two in a green. Yeah, I like a couple things about this card. Number one is it reminds me of uh, Siggy being on the podcast. Uh, number two is that uh, it, it, it helps stock your graveyard uh, for other flashback or, or uh, disturb cards while also being something you can flip over for value. Like you play an eccentric farmer and flip this over. The one thing I don't like about it is it does require, you know, 16 or more creatures, something like that, 15, 16 to really start to get a good rate because this doesn't hit land. So casting this and just seeing, look at the cards and clicking OK to put all three in your graveyard is something that happens at a, a rate that high enough that I'm not like, I'm not going to play this card unless I'm getting a lot of value out of my graveyard. But mm-hmm. I do like playing this card in, in the blue, green or black, green decks. Turn the Earth is uh, green for an instant. Choose up to three Target cards in graveyards, the owners of those cards shuffle them into their libraries and you gain two life, and then it flashes back for one and a green. Yeah, I – basically, if you play this card, you should you should pump the fist because the only time you should play this card is if you really get, got there on self-mill. Mm-hmm. And I, I have only played this card once or twice I, I, and it's just – if you've got the like triple organ hoarder, double eccentric farmer, double tapping at the window deck that has a couple good bombs, like this card can actually make an appearance, but you have to be really hard on self mill. Otherwise it's not really worth it. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I always get it mixed up with the regrowth too, which is also not that good. Um, Defend the Celestis is next. This is two green, green instant distribute three plus one plus one counters among one, two or three target creatures you control. No, I'm not that interested in defending the Celestis. Uh, they can they can have it for all I care. It's just 
a kind of expensive combat trick that is not always going to end up, you know, having the right timing for for it to work out because it costs so much. It, it can be powerful when it lands. The, the upside is definitely there. Yeah. But I I just have I have not found it to be worth the extra amount of mana or picking it early. Yeah, this one is one of those cards that I never take early and therefore never get because other people value them higher. But look at the removal and bounce in the format and you'll you'll go down a bit on Defend the Celestis. Last uncommon is Overwhelmed Archivist. This is two and a blue, three, two, and an ETBs. You loot and you can disturb it for a two, one flyer that when it attacks, you loot. Oh, this card's fantastic. Here, Here's a card yeah. I'm willing to take. Like, this is a card I'm happy to take first. It's good in any of the blue archetypes. It's just a very strong card. Yeah, finally, by the way. This pack was actually quite weak overall. Oh, yeah. Like, no removal. Um, our rare is an interesting one. It's Catilda Donhart Prime. That's the green white one one with protection from werewolves and humans you have, you control have tapped to add one mana of any color, uh, of that creature's colors, I should say. And then perhaps best of all, it has four green white tap it to put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. So it can totally take over the late game. Oh man, I'm slamming Catilda Donhart yeah, here. This card's dope. I love this card. I, I've been enjoying drafting white green, and mm. I th- ha- find this card to be, if not answered and played early, just unbeatable. And even when played late, if not answered, very strong. Because yeah. it's a mana dork that sometimes actually gives you two or three mana because there's lots of humans in green white. You know, you Lunark Veteran into this, right? It's just game. Mm-hmm. And then it also just has this huge mana sink on the other side of it, so it works very well with itself. That's right. M- must, must, must kill. Like you, I, there's a lot of ways to kill it, but you have to, if you, if you don't, the game ends very quickly. Yeah. Catilda. That's exactly what I would take as well. Uh, let's talk about the showdown. Yeah. So we had the, uh, this was the sixth LR versus LOL showdown. And, uh, as, as per tradition, BK did one draft before <laughs> this draft here, and then he ran the tables with a, with a straight up three O. So <laughs> he drafted black green, like the worst archetype. Too. He drafted black green splash blue. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, basically he ended up, uh, drafting a kind of like black green aggro playing a bunch of cards, not typically played like, uh, you know, bat the, the four, two that makes a one, one bat and like, you know, uh, in shady travelers and stuff splashing for double winter thorn blessing, the blue green tap card. So he three owed, uh, uh, you went two one and I went one, two. So we won the showdown six to three though. It actually started out, you know, me and you lost round one, BK won round one. We're down one, two round two. I lost fairly quickly. And then you and BK were playing and then uh, BK ended up winning. And then it looked like you were going to lose. You were down a game and missed your third land drop in game two. Yeah, that was uh, really tough. Managed. Oh, you drafted red, black, like mid range vampires, you know, which is exactly where you want to be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and but you battled back. You ended up uh, using stolen vitality, a card that I know that you did, you did not enjoy having to put in your deck. And uh, you ended up pulling that one out. And then game three, you ended up winning. And so all of a sudden it was tied 3-3, going to the final round. And then we just swept them, actually. I My, my black-white aggro deck is what I, I drafted, the kind of like black-white sacrifice aggro. I lost badly to the blue-green decks played by uh, Mr. Metronome and Corda Calls. But Ethan, uh, you know, Lord Tupperware playing kind of like a Naya deck. Green, green-white splash for Tovalar, like Naya deck. Uh, I just had a great draws against him, ran him over, and then you two both won as well. So all of a sudden, we were the champions. Yeah, it was great. You know, the I think the one of the interesting things that happened um, was we really did get to leverage the team draft aspect because you played against Corticals and then got to tell me kind of what was going on. And one of the keys was that he had – was it three of the two, four – Reach spiders yeah, well, that died to another ben, one? Ben had three of the... It was Ben. Right, ben not Cord, three, it was Ben. Well, it's part of why I lost so badly. I had a bunch of 2-2 flyers, and he had three of the 2-4 reach spider that dies into a 1-2. Right. And so, you know, when Luis told me that, I had a fairly aggressive deck. I had two um, Falconrath Perforators. That's the two ones. I had, you know, the 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 one drop that pumps up and has first strike when it's attacking. I had a Vampire Interloper. Right. These are the type of cards that really don't perform well against two, four flyers that die into one, two reachers, excuse me, two, four reaches that die into one. So I actually changed out like maybe five or six cards from my 
deck. And these weren't sideboard cards that I was bringing in, meaning that they weren't like, you know, plummets and that type of thing. I just changed the composition of my deck. So I brought in things that had three toughness. So I brought in a couple more of those, um, the guy that we just talked to, Famished Foragers or whatever. Those are four threes. So those match up perfectly with, with the two four blockers. And then I even brought in some of the brimstone guys, the stupid two threes. And then I brought in, um, pump spells, you know, p- plus three, plus one, uh, vampire pump spells. And so that way, you know, when my guy got blocked, I could pump it and kill it and still keep my guy. And that to me, you know, is when we do our sideboard shows and we talk about sideboarding, that's why sideboarding can be so important. Now I had a leg up because I got to talk to my teammates about what type of cards, um, Ben had in his deck. And so that, you know, of course, I had to play game one without them. But after that, I was able to make some pretty significant changes, even after only having seen like one of the spiders in the first game. But changing, you know, six cards of your 23 is a huge change. You know, it's a quarter of your deck is changing. But that was the reason was that I was able to get past him was because those cards, um, you know, were able to match up better than the ones that I had prior. So always keep that in mind that sideboarding isn't just about, um, you know, silver bullet type cards that kills specific threats or specific things on the other side. It's also about changing the composition of your deck to match up against the composition of your opponent's deck. So, and we won. That was sweet. Um, yeah, I, I look mm-hmm. forward to the next one. Uh, you know, we're, we're four two, so we got a, a nice little lead, but that was a super close showdown. Oh uh, yeah. There was only that one that wasn't. Yeah. They're generally very close. Like the last yeah. round, it's usually up in the air. We had that one where we kind of rolled them. Um, but then the other times it's always been like, I mean, these are very, very, very close. This one was yeah. no exception. Um, let's talk about the format. Yeah. So, you know, I've been playing, playing a ton of this and, uh, really, really been enjoying this format. I find the gameplay to be awesome. If you've watched any of the streams or draft videos I put up, uh, you know, or we did the, our drafts together on, on the stream the week before, there, there's so much play in all the games and that's just what I'm here for. Also, as the format has normalized, so this is a, a big thing to keep in mind while drafting, I just forced blue-black, or not forced, like hard force, but I always ended up in blue-black. My first, like, of my first 35 drafts, I was blue-black 25 of them or something. Now the people have caught up. Like, I, I just got on that deck really early uh, just because I'm really skilled at, at analyzing draft formats. No, <laughs> just because I, I read Organ Hoarder mostly. But uh, <laughs> you, and you end up now drafting everything. At least I do. Uh, I do too. So we're going we're gonna to get to like a, a deck, a deck, a color pair rankings because I think that's actually kind of interesting now that we have a lot more info. But overall, there's some things to keep in mind with this format. Um, there is a lot of onboard complexity. So really focus on playing well. Like I understand that while you're drafting, you should focus on drafting well. while you're playing. You should focus on playing well. But if you had to like try to pick which area to improve more, I would spend more time trying to like up your gameplay because uh, the, that's just such a big part of what this format's got going on. I think it's one of the biggest gaps that we've had really in recent memory. I I was talking to my stream yesterday when I was streaming, and I was talking about watching you play your stream. And it's like, you know, when I normally watch you or any other like really top tier player play, I'm usually pretty much right there. I'm like, yep, I would have done that. Yep. Okay. And then if something is different, I'll be, it'll stand out to me a little bit and I'll be like, oh, you know, hmm, what can I learn here? Right? Like I, I would have done something differently. What's going on here? And, you know, I'm lucky enough to be able to just ask you, you know, hey, w- what was that about? And then I can, I can learn like that. But this format has just been peppered with that. When I watch your stream, it's like, I feel like I'm trying to keep up with you. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're doing stuff and I'm like, oh, 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 right, okay. And then, oh, Jesus, he did. All right. No, you're not going to attack. Oh, right. And I'm just like, I feel like I'm because you also play fast. But normally I feel like I can be half a step ahead, right? And like anticipate what's going to happen. I mean, that's what I have to do in the booth and stuff too. But now I don't feel that way. I feel like this has been one of the most skill testing formats we've had. And, you know, I think that your success shows that as well, right? That you have just been absolutely crushing this. And a lot of the really great players have been as well. And, uh, and I do chalk that up primarily to the, uh, to the gameplay rather than the draft portion. Although the draft has also been, um, you know, pretty varied now. 
Anyway, um, it's definitely a feature, but I have definitely seen people on Twitter who have said, well, this format's really hard. Like I'm struggling. And I just wanted people to know that they're not alone with that. Like this is a very difficult format that really requires a pretty deep understanding of the strategic elements. I've definitely had mistakes that I've made, not just little like oversights. I've had plenty of those, but even, you know, like, oh, I'll just get in for an attack here and then just sort of had the world unfold in front of me and going like, wow, that, that attack just like was really bad. Like, you know, not the kind of thing where it's like, well, you're going to give up a little damage here. It was like, I now can't come back. Most formats don't have that. AFR wasn't like that at all. You you had more wiggle room than this one gives. So keep that in mind. Yeah. And just keep in mind, there's a lot of different ways to use your cards. Like, you know, an interaction I had come up uh, was you had the three, four rare that gives your tap creatures death touch. And I was playing mm-hmm. green, white. So I blocked with a token and used my tapper to tap my token to give it death touch. And like, so cool. And that's the sort of thing that just, you don't see like, you know, AFR didn't have this kind of deep gameplay. So definitely, uh, you want to keep that in mind. Um, in general, there's a lot of ways to gain card advantage in the format. And so cards, you know, and, and we'll talk about this when we talk about individual cards, but like it, I would be, we're, we're high on cards that give you extra cards, while also putting something on the board, there's yes. a reason Organ Hoarder is just amazing. But past Organ Hoarder, like Eccentric Farmer, um, the Overwhelmed Archivist, it's not like literally plus cards, but draw and discard is still kind of card flow. That sort of thing is so much more valuable than cards like Vivisection or even Memory Deluge. I have just not been that impressed with with that sort of thing because there's just ways to get ahead on cards that also kind of develop your board. And there's ways that you know don't, don't develop your board and those are just worse. Yeah. Um, have you seen the, or maybe we can talk, I don't know when you want to talk about it, but I did want to bring up the kind of jack-o'-lantern deck. Yeah, we, we can, we can talk about that a little later, but I do think jack-o'-lantern okay, uh, cool. is definitely a real card. Um, you also want to keep in mind, uh, there's just a lot of synergies in the format and there, you know, there's some cards that go from, you know, unplayable to great, depending on what else you have in your deck. There's there's cards that really enhance your your stuff, and then there's just you know obviously cards with raw power level that you're fine to play in any deck anyway. So, a lot, lot of different things going on that you really want to keep in mind when you're playing through the format. But I found it a really exp- uh, you know kind of enjoyable to explore everything that's going on there. Um, we're, well, you know, when you, well, let's take a look at the color pairs so we can kind of discuss kind of the the how where colors land in the format because. When it comes to a tier list, I think the two S tier decks, like the two best decks, uh, are blue, white, and blue, black. Mm-hmm. And that they are just kind of, you know, reasonably far ahead of everything else. It's just great card quality, uh, great synergistic game plans. But, you know, they they're it's like high power level plus synergy is just an absurd combination because you have a blue, black deck that is, gets to play Eaten Alive and Defenestrate and Ecstatic Awakener and, and Startle and, you know, Organ Hoarder which work really well together, but are also all just great cards. So you you don't really cost yourself while playing Synergy. Whereas, you know, when, when we go down further, we have decks that also have really good Synergy, but are a little bit lacking in the just individual power level. Whereas Blue, White, and White, Black, like Blue, White is this kind of Flyers Tempo Disturb deck that just get, makes really good use of all the Disturb and Disturb payoffs, but also just naturally is like, I'm just playing Flyers on turns two, three, and four and casting a Bounce Spell. Right. And it can really just go over the top or fly over uh, a lot of the defenses of other decks. So really like blue, white and blue, black. And, you know, part of the reason that uh, I'm, I think actually blue is the best color. I don't think black's the best color anymore is that blue has two of the be- best decks. And then next d- down the list is blue, green, which is also very good. Blue, red, I'm not that high on anymore. Uh, I just keep having bad experiences with it. Mm-hmm. But if three of the four blue combinations are fantastic – you know, that means that that speaks well for blue. And, and obviously blue is a very deep color as well. The deepest color. Yeah, it yeah. is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the next tier of decks, these three decks are kind of like the A tier decks. This is white, black, white, green, and blue, green. And uh, so white, black is kind of the, the sacrifice synergy deck. It's kind of like if you took blue, black zombies, but you had the, the various white like token making and, you know, sacrificing payoffs compared to the the blue card so that makes it a little worse but still it can be very good and there's some some real good stuff we're going to go over the top comments for each deck so i'm not going to talk about those yet and then uh white green is a more aggressive slant here where you're just trying to curve out with in particular candle grove witch and the harvest tide century the three one a, a good curve of creatures obviously there's like a humans theme in white green but i don't find that to be a big part of the deck it's mostly no. just 
you curve out well and you play a key removal or pump spell to get over the top. Yeah, that's by the way become my pet deck. Yeah, it's fun, right? It's mm-hmm. a good deck. It's very good. Um, and then uh, blue green, and this is a pretty heavily synergy driven deck. This is the kind of self mill disturb deck that is looking to play eccentric farmer, play organ hoarder, play tapping at the window, uh, use larder zombie. Just get a lot of cards in its graveyard naturally. And then has Disturb and Flashback cards to kind of take advantage of the fact that it's kind of stocked its graveyard and, you know, gets to play a bunch of stuff. So another good deck, again, a little more reliant on Synergy than something like Blue Black or Blue White, but still can be very good when it comes together. And Green's also a a pretty solid color. If you look, you know, if you look at the – basically these are the top half of the decks, right? These five decks. Yeah. Blue shows up twice, White shows up twice, Green shows up twice, and Black shows up twice. Mm Mm-hmm. Guess what does not show up a single time? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, white shows our, up. Sorry, blue and white both red. show up three times. So yeah. that's actually part of the reason that blue, I like blue and white so much. Sorry. They both show up three times. Black and green show up twice. And and red zero. Red zero times. Ugh. So if we, if we move down, we have in the next tier, the B tier, green, black, and red, black. And green, black is – Basically, I think a worse, generally worse version of blue green, but it does a lot of the same stuff. The reason I say worse is it gets more individually powerful cards, like the black removal in particular, but it's worse at self milling because it loses all the blue self mill or card advantage cards. And too often, in my experience, plays as kind of like just green black good stuff, which is fine, except the other decks, the, the better decks, have good stuff plus synergy. And this is a little bit lower on the good stuff and a little bit lower on the synergy. That said, you know, if, if you end up getting past good green-black cards, then it can definitely be a, a fine deck. And mm-hmm. then um, red-black, which you could either draft as vampires or spells, neither of them I think are fantastic. And you, it's kind of tough because if you go down one direction, it, it, it does hurt you when you're trying to go down the other direction because there's cards that overlap, but there's also a lot of cards that don't. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you, did, you did manage to have a good performance in the showdown. But your deck was actually kind of the exact like problem I have with red black, which totally. is you partially were down the vampire path, but also were kind of a little down the like spells grind you out path, and that's like not a great place to end up. Yeah, it's really tough when you're playing a deck that if it has, uh, you know, Falcon Wrath, uh, what's a you know two one flying camp block, and also has Arden Elementalist in it. It's kind of like where are we going here, right? And that happens a lot with these decks. The other thing I want to note about red, black, and and to a lesser extent, green, black, is that I've had versions of these decks that I thought were good and didn't do well. And that's happened a lot of times where with the upper tier decks like blue, white, and blue, black, when that happens, uh, if I don't do well, I know exactly why. And with these decks, it's just sometimes the deck does the thing that it's trying to do and I still don't win. And it's like that, that to me signals that there's some type of, of weakness in the strategy. Definitely. And if you want to talk about weaknesses and strategy, the, the <laughs> next three decks are the decks that I really try to avoid drafting. Here's the good news. You can draft literally any color combination, except maybe red-green to a degree, but almost every color combination. If both those colors are open, you'll end up with a fine deck. Yep. Like, there's reason to draft all these decks, and that's really good. I think that that's a, a really I'm, strong – I'm relieved that that came around, yes. Yeah. So like – I've had decks where like I open a good green rare and then get past a couple black removal spells and then get a fifth pick clear shot. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be black green. This will be fine. I don't feel bad about it. But the last three decks, blue, red, red, white, and red, green. Oh, look, it's all the red decks. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. There they are. Blue, red. As I, I think that the best way to draft it is, is the aggressive spells deck. Agreed. That overall I think is, is best. That's kind of what we said last time. There's the controlling spells deck, but I, I find that one to not be very successful. But I also just find the archetype as a whole to not be the place you, you really want to be because this is like the worst kind of synergy deck where when you get all the synergistic pieces and you draw them in the right order and they play together, you end up with a deck about as good as the the best decks that just always draw fine. Yeah, like on an average draw for them. Yeah, and that's just a really vulnerable place to be because you will lose badly when you just don't either get enough of the synergy pieces or draw them in the wrong order, whereas – if you have 23 playable blue and black or blue and white cards, like your deck's going to be good. It just mm-hmm. doesn't need much more than that. It, the synergies are kind of baked in so deeply. Yeah. Red-white is Boros aggro. It just happens that I think that the green cards are much better for this aggro white-based strategy than red-white. If you have a couple Sunrise Cavaliers, the red-white golden common that like is a 3-3 haste trample that also 
puts counters on things. Like, yes, that's a good reason to be red white. Two of those and like a couple good red removal spells in your white deck is totally fine. But again, it's just doesn't come together enough that I really am looking for this. And then the much maligned red green, which I, I'm starting to believe, you know, the, the experts like Cuneo says this, and uh, I, I know Corticals likes this. I was actually watching uh, some of Cord stream. Um, that red green should be drafted as a spells deck where you're mm -hmm. using like electric revelations and, and red burn spells and shadow beast, you know, rising and, and like other or shadow beast sighting and stuff like that. I still just don't really believe in this deck all that much. And I think you shouldn't draft it unless you're, you're, it's like abundantly clear that this is the the direction you open a moon veil region, get past two clear shots or something. Yeah. I mean, it's cool that people found a different version to draft, but it's, it's not like that's just clearly a great deck either. No, I really don't think it is. So, yeah. so basically starting with, I mean, it's strongest to start in blue because it's, it's the two best decks plus one of the second best decks starting in white is also really good because of the, the, the concentration of good decks and starting in black. So you want to, you still want to start the Esper colors, Though if you end up in green, that's totally fine too. Green also, I think, has the highest concentration of really good rares where you end up with like a Tovalar's Huntmaster, a Consuming Ooze. You know, cards like that can can really get you started. Augur of Autumn, you know, Briar Ridge Tracker. So you've got a lot of reasons to start green and, that, and that's fine too. Half the green decks, I think, are in a good spot. I just don't really like green, black or green, red all that much. So mm -hmm. overall though, I would say this is, not a terribly imbalanced format. Like I wish red was better. I think that it is unfortunate that red is as bad as it is and that werewolves are as bad as they are. But looking at this, there's five of the 10 archetypes. I'm just actively happy to be in two more that I'm like, okay, being in and three that I'm kind of unhappy to be in. But even if you discounted those completely, seven out of 10 is not bad. Yeah. And, and having the top five, cause I don't think there's a dramatic difference between black, white, white, green, blue, green, and then the top two. Mm hmm. So having the top five all be pretty good and then two more be solid, that's totally fine. And plus you can draft the other three if it comes down to it. So it looks a lot more balanced than I think people might have thought a week in. And part of that was I do think that uh, the draft populace as a whole wasn't quite tuned into how good all the blue cards and black cards were and they, they naturally fit together so well. Yeah, it's really – you know. People always talk about the self-correcting nature of draft, and there are imbalances big enough so that you can't actually correct back from it, but it looks like that isn't the case here. People have really gone deep, not only on uh, trying out the other color pairs and really giving them more of a shot as they've become more open, as there's always two to three people fighting for blue-black, but beyond that, they found different ways to draft within the archetypes, which I think is an important feature of trying to balance out, because if you can make cards that are deemed unplayable by the community effectively playable, then all of a sudden there's a lot more wiggle room for you to, they, they, they have to be, I mean, they actually have to like do reasonable things in the game, but if they do um, and you know about them, then you actually can uh, counter draft. You can actually fill in those gaps that are left over when, you know, the dust settles on everybody trying to get the blue and the black cards. So let's take a look at some of the, the, the top commons for the top five decks. Um, mm -hmm. So for blue-white, for really all, all the blue decks, Organ Hoarder is the best common. It just yep. is a mythic common, which we it don't is. have in most sets, actually. No, no, this is one of the first ones. And it just, the win rate is through the roof, despite it also being average picked at like 3.3 or something. Like people have now caught on. You don't get past these very often. And uh I am I'm extremely happy whenever if I ever have a deck with two at this point, I'm like, we did it. I know. Just, Remember how early you were on this too? Oh yeah. I I mean I, I I have a lot of experience in evaluating card draw spells. <laughs> yeah, but I mean you were really just like organ hoarder over everything. You know, it was the first couple of days of the format and you were already, you know, really preaching hard about organ hoarder, and it was like you know, there's a temptation to be a little hyperbolic in that early stage. Just kind of, and you were on your stream, so maybe you're hamming it up, but it was like, no, you were just a hundred percent right. Like this card, you know, it, cause people kept throwing harder and harder pitches at you. They were like, well, would you pick it over this? And you're like, yeah, I just take organ order. And then like, well, what about this one? This is a rare. I'll just take organ order. You know, what about memory deluge? Oh, I take organ order, you know? And it was like, it ended up being that you were dead on. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a card that you don't – it puts a decent body into play. Obviously, 4-mana 3 is a little bit worse than uh, 
than than the than what you'd expect for four mana. Mm -hmm. But then it doesn't even just draw you a card. It draws you the best of three cards and the other two go to your graveyard. No. And this is a graveyard set. Plus it's a zombie for, you know, just additional value. So Yeah. And the fact yeah. that you can buy it back or blink it back to, or return it back to your hand, there's spells in this format that do both of those things. Um, you know, makes it so that even just having an organ organ hoarder in your sort of vicinity means that you could assemble a bit of a card draw engine. Yeah, it's it's just an incredible card. Be best card for blue white for sure. Uh, and then uh, Lunar Veteran number two. The, mm -hmm. You know, the, that was a bit of a sleeper. The one mana one one soul warden that flashes back as a two mana one one flyer. Mm -hmm. So the reason that this is so strong is soul warden by itself wouldn't be quite enough. And obviously flashing back as a one on flyer is good. And then the combination of them, plus the fact that the, they both gain you life in different ways and you can play them directly out of your graveyard if you mill them or discarding the shipwreck sifters. When you just lead on Lunark Veteran, sometimes it gets one or two points of damage in, but even when it doesn't, you'll gain like five life and then it'll like chump and then you'll flash it back. It really does everything you want. Yeah. Uh, and that leads us to number three, which is a card which I've, I'm really high on if you look at all these lists, Beethook Angler. Mm -hmm. Two mana, two mana, two one, and it flashes back as a one two flyer. Again, all the things that are true of Lunar Veteran are basically true of this. Just good value play. This one actually brawls. When you play it on turn two, you can expect to trade for a lot of the, the cards they could play on turn Definitely. two. Definitely. And this is partly why I think some of the aggro decks are just not that good. When when you play like, you know, your Pestilent Wolf or your Lambholt Harrier on turn two, and they play a Beethook Angler, it's like cool. Our two drop yeah. trade and they get a one two flyer. <laughs> and and they're paying nothing for it. Like oh, yeah. there's no downside to their play. It's really yeah. tough. Um and then shipwreck sifters, and it's tricky. So shipwreck sifters, there's the one in a blue, one two, draw a card, and then discard a card. But whenever you discard a spirit or disturb card, it gets a plus one plus one counter. I think that if you know your blue white, this is the the, the second best blue common after Bait Hook Angler and or mm. sorry, and Organ Hoarder, but Organ Hoarder basically doesn't count. Um mm -hmm. but if I had an organ hoarder and a bait hook angler, I don't, I'm not saying I would take a shipwreck sifters over a falcon abomination, the card I have next, or a revenge of the drowned. Cause if you end up in blue, black, or blue, green, ship, well, if you end up in blue, black, shipwreck sifters, you're, you're not going to play that often. I tend not to play them in blue, black. Mm -hmm. In blue, green, you often do play them because you so heavily prioritize disturbed cards. And but, flashback, yeah. Yeah, though it's not a combo with flashback as much. It doesn't get the counter off flashback, which, right. is, which, which is big because you really want this to be a two, three on two. Yeah, that's true. Um, but when you know your blue white, if, if you, you know, if you open Denik and then took an organ hoarder, I would, I would take shipwreck sifters or Falcon abomination because shipwreck sifters in the blue white deck is like two mana, two, three draw a card with additional upside. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's a little bit of hyperbole, insane. but yeah, but it, it works also when you have multiples, it's so good. Turn two sifters, turn three sifters is unbeatable. Assuming you're discarding spirits or disturbed cards mm -hmm. because you end up with a 3-4 and a 2-3 because they trigger off each other. Right. And then they work with Faithful Mending and it's just, it's just a really good card. And then I've got Falcon Abomination. I really do like the card. 3-mana, 2-2 two, two flyer, make it a Decay token. It's weaker in blue-white than it is in blue-black because you don't have as many ways to use the Decay token outside like a Ska Wrangler. Mm -hmm. It's still good. It's a 2-2 two, two flyer for 3 that sometimes gives you an additional shock. Just pure rate, right? I mean, yeah. it just – yeah. And then uh, moving past, that's like that kind of the top five. Revenge of the Drowned, Flip the Switch, just two good kind of like tempo plays that make zombies. And then a Candle Grove Witch, which is much lower in blue-white than it is in white-green. It's like critical in white-green, whereas in blue-white, I think it's just okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, Gale Drifter, Search Party Captain, Larder Zombie. I've been actually really impressed. Even in this aggro deck, you just have enough creatures running around to tap to it. And it can flip disturb cards into your graveyard and just make it so you just draw five lands and all spells afterwards. Right. It's still pull yeah, especially just for the one mana. And then uh Startle's also one worth noting. So that's kind of like the top, I don't know, eleven commons or so. Mostly blue cards because blue is just a dominant color, you know? It's just mm -hmm. that strong. Yep. For blue black, again, starting on Oregon Hoarder, next up is Ecstatic Awakener, which it's actually kind of like an organ hoarder. It's a four mana, four, four draw card. <laughs> yeah. It's so easy in blue black to have a, a free or even beneficial thing to sack to it. Yes. And then um, Diagraph Horde, I, I have it number three though. So so the next three cards, Diagraph Horde, Eaten Alive, and Olivia's Midnight Ambush, I think are very close. Mm -hmm. And one of the things to keep in mind, when I t say these lists, it's without having very many cards in your pile that I have this order. Once you have... 
you know, a, a decent set, like a set of cards, it could easily change. If it's pack two and you don't have any removal spells, yeah, I'd take Eaten Alive over Ecstatic Awakener or Diagraph Horde. You know, if it's pack three and I don't, and I have two bait hook, uh, you know, two bait hook anglers and like two startles, I'd probably take Ecstatic Awakener over Organ Hoarder because it's just that curve is just so brutal. It's interesting. Um, I feel like people have gone down a little bit on Diagraph Horde. I have not. Uh, basically, every single time I put it on the stack and it hits the, the battlefield, I just still can't believe that it's a common. I mean, you play you play against like <laughs> blue blue green or or blue white, and you cast this card and eat a disturbed card or two, and it's just like what? It's like, like is this real? Like, why do they need to do all this extra? Like, why do I get two zombies and not one? Like, why? Yeah. <laughs> why am I yeah, exiling like two, two cards. cards? Right? <laughs> it's like it's just insane. And then yeah, the removal tends to kind of blend together a little bit because it's all you know roughly playable at the same clip. Um. Yeah, so the the top five is basically Organ Hoarder, Awakener, Horde, and then the two two good removal spells. Defenestrate's also fine, but I think it's a lot worse than those other two because Eaten Alive kills anything and Exiles. Also, it's very cheap because you just, again, have all these free tokens. Yeah. And then Olivia's Midnight Ambush is a good curve spell that also happens to kill a lot of the big creatures in the format because you just pass if they play a werewolf. And then once it flips, you just uh, you just cast this. That's right. Uh, Bait Hook Angler is still excellent in this deck. Yep. You know, flip the switch, Revenge of the Drown. And, the, and these are also like your curve will dictate where you take these as well. If you've got double Organ Hoarder and a Diagraph Horde, I'm a lot more likely to take a Bait Hook Angler over, you know, any of the more expensive spells just to make sure I can survive to play my good cards. Uh, Siege Zombie, Defenestrate, Startle, Larger Zombie again makes an appearance. Again, um, all, all these fantastic cards. Oh, Falcon Abomination actually I'd put above, uh, below Bait Hook Angler and above Flip the Switch. So Yeah, Siege Zombie to me is the one that stands out as particular to this deck. Uh, you know, it really does shine here. Yeah. And, and also when you have a Siege Zombie or two, once I have two Siege Zombies, I don't value the third very high because mm -hmm. they, you don't really need multiples here. Yep. Um, so moving on to, 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 to White Black, White Black tends to be – pretty heavily themed towards sacrifice and the white black uncommons uh flesh taker and the right of oblivion really push you in that direction so you know keep that in mind i most often end up in white black because i have gotten past like a fourth pick flesh taker or something like that though obviously sometimes you just open you know the the banishing light borrow time and then get past uh, olivia's midnight ambush and then get past a good white common then a good black common and you just end up but uh Ecstatic Awakener number one, Eaten Alive number two, Diagraph Horde number three. So a bunch of black cards, followed by a Lunark Veteran sneaking in there, and then Olivia's Midnight Ambush. Yeah, this one gets to leverage the Lunark Veteran as, as this thing that you can sacrifice twice, but also does work outside of that. Uh, with Siege Zombie and Search Party Captain kind of following up there. Uh, yeah, I like the uh, Captain a lot too. As solid ones. I'm 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 okay on Gavity Trapper here. I would play one for sure, but this deck can be mana intensive and Gavany Trapper is like really, I think at its best in green, white, just the, the low curve deck that can tap can curve out and then start using the tapper every turn is a lot better than the deck that has a lot of ways to spend its mana. It's part of the reason I yeah. don't even have Gavany Trapper in like the top 10 blue, white is that I just find you don't really run out of stuff to do with your mana, which makes it much bigger cost to use it. Yeah. Uh, for blue, green. So blue, green again is a, a much more, synergistic deck so actually for number one it's still organ hoarder um <laughs> it's actually perfect for the deck followed by the green organ hoarder eccentric farmer yeah so th this guy's really good in the deck it's a three mana two three that often will draw you a land and maybe put a disturbed card in your graveyard one of the things that you can sometimes look for is if your curve allows it don't play the farmer until after you've done some other self move just to guarantee you hit a land there's nothing worse than playing it on turn three and missing a land Right. So there's always the sweat in this format when you actually need that land. <laughs> oh yeah. It's also always the last. It's like not land, not land, land <laughs> every time. Uh, and then uh, bait hook angler is just outstanding in this deck. It might yeah. even be better than in blue white somehow. It's just exactly what the deck wants. It's a good two drop and you just cast them for free later in, in the game. Uh, Revenge of the Drowned I found to be quite strong in the deck just because it doesn't have that many interaction points. I don't like Duel for Dominance very much, the green fight spell, the right. common one, because just your your unless you got a Shadow Beast sighting, your creatures are kind of small. So it just ends up not really working out as often as I would like. Whereas obviously clear shot at uncommon is just ridiculously good. Um mm -hmm. Harvest Tide Sentry is also really good. 
the hmm. two mana three one that has coven can't block it with two power or less. And it's funny because you don't this deck's not really an aggressive deck. Yeah, out I was the gonna gates. say that. Hmm. But there, I, I like it for a couple of reasons. One is a three one blocks pretty well. It can yep. block most things in trade. The other is that when, when you get a couple uh, Winterthorn Blessings, the blue-green uncommon tap, put a plus and plus one counter, all of a sudden your deck actually is interested in killing them. And this just fills up the two-drop slot, plus it's a creature. And this deck wants to play, if you want to use tapping at the window, like 16 creatures a lot of the time. But you have this above Shadow Beast sighting. I think it's very close. It, okay. it really just depends on your curve. If you are, again, like... Early, I would actually take Shadow Beast Sighting, but if you look at Organ Hoarder and Revenge as two high picks, mm -hmm. that starts getting me to the point where I just you just need Harvest Tide Centuries because you need cards to to play. Again, if it's if it's pick five and you so far have, you know, two Organ Hoarders because you're really lucky, uh, an Eccentric Farmer, and uh, let's say a Flip the Switch, I would probably take Harvest Tide Sentry over Shadow Beast Sighting there. Okay. Whereas because you just can't pick, have that many four drops. If it's pick five and I've and I have like eccentric farmer, clear shot, bait hook angler, falcon abomination, I'll take Shadow Beast Sighting. Okay. So it it, it 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 kind of just does depend. But I have Shadow Beast Sighting next, kind of like they're 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 basically tied. Um and then uh, Falcon Abomination, flip the switch. Larder Zombie, once again, just appears in every blue archetype except blue-red. Yep. Maybe part of the reason I don't like blue-red that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so you, you're trying to go pretty hard on the self-mill stuff. You don't have to. You can play this as a more straightforward like blue-green curve deck. But the best versions tend to have a decent amount of self-mill. And you obviously hope to get some decent uncommons in the mix as well. So for green-white uh, – here it's almost just straight up a curve. Look, Lunark Veteran into Candlegrove Witch, into Harvest Tide Sentry, into Eccentric Farmer, into Gavany Trapper. Not bad. And, and you, you're just usually just trying to put a lot of power on the board, you know, curve out and, uh, and attack your opponents. And then uh, that lets you leverage the tricks pretty well. So there's three common tricks, right? There's a, there's Flare of Faith, uh, Beacon of, or Blessing of Defiance, and um, – the uh, Might of the Old Ways. Mm -hmm. So this is the plus two, plus oh, lifelink, make a one, one when it dies, plus two, plus two, or plus three, plus three, destructible if it's a human, and then plus two, plus two, and then coven, draw a card. And they're all good, and they're all close enough. I love that, that green one. No, I think they're all good. They're mm -hmm. all close enough that I think that you don't need to uh, prioritize them all that much. Because you want like three or four in these decks, but you kind of don't care what the mix is. You'd almost rather just have a mix. What about um, Gavany Silversmith? I, I, I found Gavany Silversmith to be a little lackluster. Okay, a little slow for your taste? I think it's okay, but it – I don't know. The two plus one plus one counters, if you don't put one on the Silversmith, you end up with the two three in play, which is a little medium. And then you have to have decent creatures in play. Like, Look, I'm not saying – you should cut them from your deck. It's good enough that you should basically always play it. But I don't I, I don't prioritize Gavany Silversmith as much as I do the the cheaper cards, basically. Yeah, I, I'm a little higher on it just because I think it's part of the best draws, right? Like, this is very much a curve-out deck. And, you know, if we like the combat tricks, if we can on turn four play the Silversmith instead, you know, that's adding to our board and probably enabling some attack that we didn't have. It also lets you mess around with Coven, you know, sometimes to get Coven where you might not have otherwise from your four drop. Yeah, it, it's a good way to get Coven. Um, but I'm not super high on it either, but it, it it is a card that I think about when I'm in the deck. So. Yeah. Uh, Search Party Captain also can be really strong in this Very deck. Good. This is this is one of the decks that most often uh, gets you to a turn three, uh, or a one mana Search Party Captain, Oof, you know, or, I love or that. And, and just playing something else in the same turn. So it, 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 it's just funny because that card obviously has potential regardless, but this is the 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 really best place to play it. One of the best uncommons for the deck I just want to mention is Dawnheart Mentor. So uh, good. Two and a green 0-4 that makes a 1-1. One, one. When you have Coven, you can pay six to give a creature a plus three, plus three and trample. This this card gives you Coven turn three, so you go turn two, Candlegrove Witch or Harvest Tide Sentry, turn three, Dawnheart Mentor, and you just attack with your unblockable creature. And then later in the game, you have six mana up, and it's like really hard to attack or block into it. Yeah, and this is where threat of activation really does come in. Um, <laughs> like not joking around, <laughs> you know, it makes your opponent's life extremely difficult as they'll often not have any profitable blocks when they factor in the fact that you could just pump, and it puts them in that position where they have to make really 
really crappy decisions. And, you know, when they have to do that, then you also get to leverage instance where you're like, well, I wasn't actually going to pump. I was going to use this removal spell or use this pump spell instead. And, uh, and you can, and you can really get people. It really dominates late too. Yeah. So, so that's kind of like the breakdown of where, where I see the commons are for like the top five archetypes. Um, mm-hmm. But let, let's talk about some cards that have kind of over and under, underperformed. Yeah, because we actually have quite a few of these. Uh, you know, I think this is the set where things have shifted around the most, not only from the set review to kind of when we first started playing, but then also from after the dust settled on, okay, blue, black's a thing. We kind of have a known uh, ecosystem here, and now it's shifting once again as we see things kind of change. What were some of the cards that stood out the most, though? Uh, so Larder Zombie has been a, a, a very solid piece of the puzzle where you basically just get a good blocker for against two twos while also getting card selection in the middle of the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in the blue black deck, it's even a somewhat relevant creature type. They're not that relevant because most of the zombie themed cards want you to attack and this can't. Uh, Startle has also been a really good value play where you get to cycle it early and make a decay token and you didn't really feel like you paid much of a cost. And sometimes it just wins you a combat and you get like a one and a half for one. You know, it's, it's a really classic like tons of upside, fairly low downside card when you look at it. Cause like you said, I mean, in your worst case, as long as there's something on the board, you can just cycle it for a card and you even have a body left over. And in your best case, as you described, it's just stupid. Like you, you can use it almost like a removal spell. Um, crawl from the cellar has been a really good way to win attrition battles. And it, this, this I think doesn't count to me as like, a card advantage card that costs you board position because the first time you cast it, you paid one mana to get your creature back and you got a plus one plus one counter. So you almost broke even right away and then just get a flashback later. Mm-hmm. That card's actually gone um, up and up in my ranks. It just seems more relevant and more relevant as the, fe- as the uh, set goes on. Uh, oh, I got to hear about this one. Here's a big one. Ominous Roost. So this is the Tuna Blue enchantment that makes a 1-1 flyer on ETB and whenever you play a card from your graveyard, but they can only block flyers. That's the reason this card hasn't didn't start out too high. I found in green-blue specifically, it's been really good, and even in blue-white, it's been solid. And the reason is there's enough good flyers that it actually has more board presence than you might think. Like sometimes mm. sometimes you play this and then ma- then flash back a bait hook angler. First of all, you have two one-on flyers. Second, if they have like a falcon abomination, like they can't really attack into you, and the ominous roost will provide value over time. So, I, I can want you about- compare it like what if what if I in most decks let's just say I took out the ominous roost and I put in um, the falcon abomination. Um, Do you I would think say my most, win rate goes up or down? I would say most decks would rather have falcon abomination, but okay. there's there's two things. One is you get ominous roost seven pick. Like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mo- rarely, most of the time, I bet this is open in a pack. No one at the table wants it. Mm-hmm. So. You're kind of making hay here because you're getting you're getting um, value from a card you wouldn't otherwise really pay that much of a cost to get. Okay. The second is index that can easily make two birds, so you end up getting three birds out of this. This card is pretty strong. Like you and, would actually, you think there are some decks that would prefer it to Falcon Abomination then? Yeah, and even if not, even when not making the direct comparison, like would you play a card that was two in the blue, make three one on flyers that can only block flyers? Like, yeah, you yeah, would, yeah, you for basically sure. always play that card. You know, you, you, mm-hmm. it's just a strong card. And these blue green turbo self meal decks can easily make three or four birds off this. And even in blue white, it's not that hard if you have, you know, some of the vicinity of eight or nine cards that flash back plus a little card draw. So I, uh, I, I, I think that you should give ominous roost a try if you haven't, I've, I've, I've found it to be good enough. Okay, and that's you said. Blue green's the place where you feel it's most at home. Blue green is the it's best, but blue white. I've also had blue white ominous roost decks that have been totally fine. Okay. Uh, Blessed defiance. I think the secret's kind of out on this one. Plus two, plus zero. Oh, Lifelink make a one one. Just really good card. It's a good card. It just you know often is one mana to, to make your creature trade up and then get a one one and get like five life. So re- re- definitely worth it. Uh, Dual craft trainer is one of the best uncommons. Really overperformed for me. This is the 3 3 first strike that if you have Coven gives double strike, usually to something else, so it can also attack. But a 3 3 first strike is just so burly, also. It is, yeah. And it also has the the benefit that you get from some of the Coven stuff, but this is probably the best of all of them, is that you can play it, and if that's what gives you Coven, then you get the double strike right now. And that's like really powerful. Like even with Don Hart Mentor, you don't get that because usually you're you don't have enough mana to activate it the turn that you play it. But here it's like 
play it, get Coven, my witch is in the air, give it double strike, hit you for four. Like it, it really piles on the pressure quickly. The the other thing is that uh, combining it with Flare of Faith is also is also pretty awesome. Which one? Oh yeah. Oh Jesus. So you you put on like a Candle Grove witch and just attack them for ten in the air. It's plus three plus That's three. Disgusting. Yeah, it can it, it can really get them. Um, Flare of Faith. Yeah, that 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 just a card that has been has been solid. And you've had good experiences with it as well. In in green white. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's like a it's a it's almost like a gold card, but it's really good in that color pair. Uh, and then uh, Neonate's Rush. This card is, I think, performed better than Moon Ranger Slash, which is pretty funny. It is the highest rated uh, red common according to 17 lands, which is kind of incredible. Um, it, The fact that it cantrips is obviously a huge part of the reason why it's so powerful, but it does actually have enough targets, particularly some of the cards that you get back from um, – disturb have one toughness like a lot of them are slightly worse than their front version and if you ever get to kill anything with neonates rush particularly if you happen to have a vampire and it's even cheaper i mean that is a blowout like that that is a legitimate you know two for one in your direction while you're removing something from the board and then you know fail case isn't that bad i think you know we thought it might be a little more towards the uh, the end of the spectrum that was like it enables the bloodthirst type of things to happen, but that isn't really what it's about. It just it just legit kills stuff often enough. Uh, it, it's also worth noting that I think all the best red decks tend to be spell decks, and this is really good in, in those spell type decks. Mm -hmm. Another card that uh, that's been performing better than I thought uh, is the Celestis. Oh yeah, I love that card. Yeah, it's been really strong. Um, you know, I, I kind of looked at it before as. Well, if I have the need for a mana rock that fixes my colors, then I'll be interested in it. But the other stuff I'm not really worried about. Like, it's not worth doing it on its own. But I was wrong. Um, it actually is. Uh, the, the, the mana rock that fixes your colors is a nice thing to have. But boy, being able to control day night is important. And the looting plus gaining a life part of it. That happens whether you activate the Celestist or not. So it, if day night is just happening, you're just getting this extra little chips of value every time. And then when you get to, you know, if you run out of gas, which doesn't happen that often, but if you do, you can start activating it or you can use it to manipulate day night, you know, to, to keep your creatures where you want or your opponents where they, where you don't want them to be. And the fact that it's colorless so any deck can play it means that, yeah, I, I take it a lot higher now. Like, <laughs> I, I used to just not take it at all, uh, but now, now I play it like I'm looking for excuses to get it in my deck. Yeah, I've been impressed. Um, so, what about Death Bonnet Sprout? You like that guy a lot now, right? Oh, yeah. Death Bonnet Sprout is really good. This is a one mana one, one green for a 1-1 one, one that mills you on upkeep, and then it flips if you have three or more creatures in your graveyard, and then it becomes a 3-3 three, three that starts eating creatures and getting plus one, plus one counters. It's yeah. great in, in blue-green, but it's just, I would play it in any green deck. Uh, just Agreed. because it's just a, I mean, you have to have a lot of creatures. If you draft red green spells with seven or eight creatures, obviously don't play this card. But mm -hmm. I haven't drafted a blue green or black green or white green deck that wouldn't just play the death bond. Agreed. It's just good. So, mm -hmm. what about cards that uh, have been worse than expected? Yeah, there's a lot actually. Um, let's start with some of the the white ones. One of them that seemed like it would be fine, particularly in a more slow controlling deck, was Beloved Beggar. Yeah, this is the two mana Never 0 4 that, <laughs> that flashes back as a six mana 4 4 flyer. I I really only like it in black white because you can sacrifice it. Even in blue white, it's it's okay if you have enough shipwreck sifters, but it's not that good because the, the main problem I have with it, and certainly do not touch this card in green white. Like, this is just the, yeah, ex too, exactly too. what green white doesn't want, uh, is they just don't kill it, and you end up with a two mana 0 4 that does nothing the whole game. Mm hmm. So um, yeah, I, I would really stick, stay away from it unless you're in black white, basically. Uh, what about the silversmith that we talked about before? Yeah, I mean we we kind of already covered it before, but I just haven't been that impressed with kind of how it's played out. It's fine. I, I don't cut it, but it's not. It, it hasn't been one of the top commons for me. Yeah, unruly mob too. I really thought it would have like a super solid home in the black white deck, but it it's just. I never, I, you know, there's formats where I find myself falling behind to like a four, four or five, five mob. That just never seems to happen in this format. There's just too much good removal. So if mob gets out of control, it gets hit by a revenge of the drowned or a defenestrate. But, and if it doesn't, they ignore it because it's a two mana one, one. Right. Exactly. So that, that's the main problem I have with it. Uh, 
Drown Yard Amalgam, this is the five mana three six that mills for three and you can make it unblockable. Just not a good card. I haven't found it to be worth really going after. And uh, no. just not a good finisher. And then similarly, the more crit behemoth, the seven six menace that you can sack a creature to play for five mana. Look, these cards are playable if you need a finisher, but I just haven't found myself in a situation that needs these that badly. So yeah, that's how I feel. I, they, they've been underwhelming. Uh, Locked in the Cemetery and Candle Trap have both been underwhelming. Candle Trap, I'm coming around a little bit on. I I think that if you coven often enough and you can treat it as like kind of a slow removal spell, it can be okay. Locks so in the cemetery. Mana exile a thing. Yeah, I mean if you if you're like playing white green and you have like five slots for spells or six slots for spells, having this be one of them is totally fine. Mm-hmm. It's Especially also, if you're well set up for it, like you said. Or if you're like blue white flyers and you can just ignore the thing once you've candle trapped it. But overall, not a high pick, but it's definitely playable. Lock in the cemetery a little worse than that. Mm-hmm. Um, covert cut burst. This is the three mana two one that flashes back as a two two flyer death touch. Yeah, a playable card, but I've never really found the damage, the kill a damage creature part to work. So the only time I've had this work is in black red exactly, where you have neonates rush and other burn spells. Mm-hmm. In like blue black or, or or white black, it's just a disturbed flashback creature, which is fine. Again, this card's playable, but it looked very good and it's only ended up okay. I thought the zombie part would be more relevant. I thought people would just block a zombie, but they often just don't. Yeah, I, I think that there's... Probably I don't know. Blade this, brand people have done a good job playing around it or, or, yeah. or what have you. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. this next These next couple have been really like... I thought they would find a home ghoulish procession. Yeah, Ghoulish Procession has been awful. Every time Terrible. my opponent plays it, I feel like I just win easily. I did play it in the showdown out of the sideboard in some matchups, but yeah, this is the enchantment that makes a decayed token when something dies, just but only once per turn. Just not that good. Uh, Vivisection we kind of talked about as Terrible. like, don't put yourself behind on board to draw cards. Heirloom Mirror is another one. The fact that you get it tapped, this is you discard three cards to turn it into a 4-4, but the 4-4 is tapped when you discard the third card. Just makes me completely underwhelmed, and I, I would avoid playing Heirloom Mirror. You know, it's one it, of the worst performing in cards in the set, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I can believe that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Defend the Celestis, we already talked about, the the pump spell. And then what about Purifying Dragon? You know, it's just like it looked like a solid, right? I mean, it has a good effect. It burns out zombies. It's a 4-3 flyer for 5. Like, you know, we gave this like a B, and it's just super mediocre. Like, really just run-of-the-mill like I would put it in the same category as any five mana common creature that's, you know, the five four trampler or whatever. It's like, yeah, it's fine. You can put it in your deck, but it, it is just not a pull to red at all. Yeah. So uh, hopefully this gives you a kind of good overview of kind of what where we think the formats are, what what we think the good decks are, some of the top commons for the decks, and then overperformers and underperformers. Great format. I would advise jumping into it if you haven't yet. And if you have, well, continue enjoying it. It's it's a really fun format. Yeah, this one has a chance to be an all-timer. Um, and I'll also remind you that uh, the World Championship is coming up this weekend, and they are drafting on it. So if you want to watch the draft, it's on Friday, um, October 8th. And you should uh, you should definitely tune in and see what the players pick. We'll we'll be watching uh, one player from each of the drafts and then, you know, doing some extended coverage around it as well. So it should be pretty cool to see how the table breaks down and uh, how the players are approaching the format. Um, That's going to do it for this episode of the show. If you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find all things related to the podcast at LRcast.com. And I'll remind you, the show is brought to you by channel fireball.com. Make sure you check out the, uh, the marketplace madness now that they've switched over to a singles marketplace you can check out what they've got going over there uh as far as singles selection goes and i think you'll be happy with it there's a big selection now because it comes from a whole bunch of stores and uh, by the way if you are a store or a single seller you can also sign up to do so you can check out the details over at channel fireball and it can be perhaps another income stream for you also we're brought to you by ftx check out ftx.us and ftx.com for outside of the u.s for all of your digital asset trading needs, including cryptocurrencies, NFTs, and everything like that. That's going to do it for this episode of the show. We'll see you next week. So, Marshall, interesting conversation today on Twitter. Uh, started kind of because <laughs> Twitch got hacked and uh, mm-hmm. the a lot of personal information, including like the how much money the top 10,000 streamers make on Twitch, uh, got posted. Oh, wow. But uh, Did I make it? Of, I did. I'm uh, 6,652. No, I said, did I make it? (laughs) 
Oh, I didn't hear you. Uh, just outside, huh? <laughs> yeah, that, probably. Hey, uh, that's pretty good for you, though, dude. Nice work. Well, yeah, it's funny because these are the top 10,000 on Twitch, which puts them in the top 1% of Twitch. And 75% of the top 10,000 don't make like that comfortable of a living if this is what they were doing full time. So <laughs> oh, that's awkward. <laughs> but uh, so I, I had a thread if you want to take a look about content creation and like kind of the risk it inherent. But I wanted to touch on a different angle of that. Which, which would take its own entire thread, which I thought was interesting, which is what does it take to succeed and how much does luck play a factor? And uh, I think a good way to, to look at it, you know, whether it's winning a magic tournament, uh, you know, becoming the, the, the best or at the top of any given field, you know, whatever it is, it's a combination of like talent. Cause I think pe- different people have different aptitudes for this stuff. Yeah. Like, I don't think you could argue otherwise. Uh, how much work you put in, you know, if two people of equal talent work one work and one works twice as much, I would expect them to on on balance have have a higher success rate. And then luck, randomness, because randomness is a big part of everything. It, even in things you don't think ha- there's randomness, there is randomness. It's just you, you can't really get away from that. And uh, when you look at like who succeeds, it's really easy for you to look at. The, like they'll tell you the work they put in and they'll tell you, here's the reasons I succeeded. A lot of times luck is not something that they, they talk about. Does some people do certainly, but I think part of that is, is, is kind of like the selection bias, you know, this, the, the bias of being a survivor because you, you're not always privy to why you succeeded in some mm-hmm. cases you are right. Like you can tell, you can say, you can say in some cases, like, let's say, Oh, I didn't draw a lane on turn three. I lost the match playing for top eight. Mm-hmm. Pretty easy to point to that. Of course, that even that example, maybe you should have played twenty six land in your deck instead of twenty four. Right. You know, maybe you played the wrong deck or whatever. Maybe, maybe you could you have played differently on turn yeah. five. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but even in examples like that, you know, it, there, there's some confounding factors, and it gets a lot trickier when you're looking at like why does this Twitch streamer succeed versus this does not? Why is this novelist succeed? Why you know what what makes person a succeed person's a's business or whatever venture they have succeed versus others and luck is just a huge part of that and the funny thing is and this is this is what people kind of don't get when they watch high level competitions too the closer two people are in skill the bigger uh, a role luck plays if two people are evenly matched in skill it will almost by definition come down to luck Mm -hmm. and there's luck in, in a lot more places than you realize as well like even when it comes to you know, basketball or something, which, you know, it's not like the, the most high variance thing, but there is some luck, right? Sometimes it bounces sure. in, sometimes it bounces out. Sometimes the ref sees something and sometimes they don't, you know, maybe nine times out of 10, the ref would have called, called that a charge. But in this one out of 10, they just didn't because humans right. are also composed of randomness. Mm-hmm. And uh, like, I think one of the useful ways to look at this is there are the things you can control are largely, you know, they're limited to basically how much effort do you put in and did you do a good job of like planning out how you're going to use that effort. You can't control your inherent talent or your aptitude, you know. Right. So don't it's not something you should really stress about too much. You definitely can't control your luck. So when you do when you feel like you've done everything you can to set yourself up to succeed, at that point, you know, you just kind of got to hope you catch the lucky break. But don't try to overly stress about the things that you can't control. Like uh, some good advice I heard was if you're worried about a situation or something coming up or you're feeling bad about something, write down all the things you're worried about, cross out the ones you can't control and work on the ones you can. That's good. You know, that's just a really easy, it's a much better way to look. Look, I mean, I think it's tempting to look at all the things um, in any given situation that are, that went against you. Um, that were out of your control and to focus on those. And, you know, there's some legitimacy to that, right? I mean, the, the, those are real things that those, you can look at those across really anywhere you look in life, you're going to find that stuff and it's, and it's real. Um, but at the end of the day, you really do have to s- decide for yourself. Well, that happened. Now what? Exactly. So, You know, if you, regardless of what you want, what ventures you want to embark upon, there's a lot of different places to go in life, whether that's personal or professional. Be just be aware that luck plays a big role, and try to kind of reconcile yourself to that. If you play a lot of Magic and you listen to this podcast, you probably have done a good job of getting a hang, getting the hang of that. (laughs) You know, it kind of beats itself into you. Uh, It does. But you know, and just 
J- just at all times, you just do your best. Like try to do your best and put yourself in the best position. Th- the way I look at it, I've you know been a part of <laughs> both failed and successful business ventures. You just got to put yourself in a position to, to to roll high. Take you know you take enough shots, and you know sometimes the the, the podcast that you think that nobody could possibly ever want to listen to ends up becoming you know you know a, 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 an actually pretty interesting podcast. <laughs> 